Well, it, well, thankfully there weren't any uh, there weren't any defects this weekend. I think we can say that. Uh, but let's get into it then, shall we? Into the race action because well, it was it was all a bit manic, wasn't it? It started with the, with the threat of rain right from the very off, but that actually held off for a fair while and allowed us to really enjoy some some fantastic fighting for the leading spots between uh, Bagnaya, Marquez, Martin, Zarco, Quattararo all having a superb battle for those uh, top positions. Uh, every lap, it seemed to be changing. In the end, it looked like it was Bagnaya who took the lead early on and looked pretty good. And then the rain came down and it all changed in those final few laps. But even before the rain, it was, it was, I mean, how was your heart rate, Keith? Were you all right with it? I was behind the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those ones where, I mean, having been there, and done that and been on a grid when it's spitting with rain and you're trying to make tire choices and the, and doesn't matter how you find your zone your zen zone that you're you're just trying to focus on what you've got to do and you can you can see them little sprinkles just appearing on the top of your visor and on the on the screen on the front of the bike and you're thinking yeah you know, you're looking around anxiously to see what everyone else has done when they pull the tire warmers off and stuff like that to see what's going on i mean uh, marquez you know he went for a soft rear straight away. He was the only guy that was out there on a soft rear. He decided that he was going to preempt a flag-to-flag -flag race, although it started as a as a dry race, didn't it? So it's, uh, at the end of the day, it was one of the ones where he decided he was going to go with that soft rear tyre to get the benefit early on in that race. And, I mean, Marquez was there or thereabouts all the way through that early stuff. I don't know. The Red Bull ring always gives us great racing. I mean, it always seems to give us those kind of electrifying races. And quite and exactly what everybody says, we're not smarter than anybody else that watches this stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all said last week, didn't we? It'll be a completely different race this week. You can have it at the same track, same bike, same blokes riding them, and it will be a completely different race. And, of course, it was completely different. Um, I mean, the pole position, it would have been the only time ever. This is Dr. Martin Reigns, not me, because I only... I, I only associate with smart people because I'm not one. And uh, Dr. Martin Rain said it would have been the only time that a, a rookie has got pole position two two times on the trot and won the race two times on the trot. It would have been the only time that's ever happened. Um, and it did look, I mean, I forget which one of you two picked Jorge Martin for the win this week. Was it you, Pete? <laughs> and I was thinking all the way through the bloody watching the early part of it, I was thinking, bastard. Which one was it? <laughs> well, that's Who the thing. Unfortunately, it? none of us scored yeah. points this week. But uh, Pete did go for Martin. <laughs> I went for Zarco. So the heartbreak when he slid out from turn nine as well. Huge championship ramifications for that as well. He slipped down to fourth now, I think, in the championship. Yeah, he has, yeah. yeah. Which, oh, so not a good day for Zarco. Because he, he had the speed. He was fighting at the top there. But just a mistake. Yeah, but he didn't get on too well with that corner, did he? That's the second time he'd been down on that particular corner. So uh, it's one of them situations with Zarka. Again, with all of these guys, they are right on the very, very edge. You know, there's, there's such a fine line, and it really, really is such a fine line. And I don't know why. I, I mean, I've said it before. Zarko just seems to be one of those guys that as you're right on the edge of things, you always wonder whether it's going to happen to him. You know, he, he doesn't... I don't think I'd put money on him at the beginning of the year to win a championship in MotoGP. It just seems like he's not going to be able to do the whole season without these kind of unforced errors. And, and it was interesting, Keith, because, of course, his teammate won, you know, and, and everyone had kind of expected that, that, that Zarko would be the guy to take the first Pramac win, you know, and then suddenly his rookie teammate comes and takes it. And so it's like, well, how would he react to that? And actually, in practice, he looked really strong, didn't he? It looked like, well, he's, he, you know, he's really responding well to this. And, and, and he, he, he looked pace wise you know capable of fighting for the victory but yeah in the in the race he, he just looked like he was having to push a little bit too hard a bit like jack miller actually you know jack said that you know he was having to push too hard he didn't have the grip that he had even in the warm up and he was just struggling and struggling and and you know as we know with jack he sort of he saw the rain coming and he and he dived into the pits but he said really it was just playing the joker card he had nothing left he he knew that he couldn't stay with them now you know whether that was the case with, with Zarko as well, that he, he, for some reason, he wasn't able to replicate the pace that he thought he had. So he found himself over the limit. Who knows? But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, as you say, down to fourth in the championship. And, um, yeah, you, you know, momentum is definitely with Banyaya and Mia, who have now moved ahead of him. It's amazing how much difference a few degrees make, a different day, the angle of the sun, 
the, the dangle of the trees, whatever it might be, there is always something that makes the tiniest little bit of difference from a weekend to weekend. That's why, you know, that's why, why we said last week it will be a completely different race meeting this weekend, and it can be different on different days. You could you could wake up in the morning on a Sunday, and for some reason, some it's not working, but it's only off by a tiny amount. That feel that you have to have when you ride a motorcycle, particularly in changing conditions, a little bit of raindrops on your visor, on the track, and it makes a difference. You can feel it, and it's almost indiscernible, but it's there. You know, it's a, something that makes the difference. And if you keep pushing, you know, you end up like Zarco did, sadly. Yeah, let's, uh, let's switch across to the factory Ducatis, pick up on, on Jack Miller there, who you said you know, didn't really have much to lose playing that joker card. It looked like it was kind of the, just about the right time to come in anyway. Um, and he was followed in, I think, by, uh, by Rins as well. Bagnaya, though, uh, looking incredibly strong even before that on the other side of the garage and was one of the riders who came in to, to change to wets and then overtook seven bikes, I think it was, in the last lap to get second. It's the easiest thing in the world, Harry. When you f see the guy in front of you die for pit lane, you do the same. You have two choices. You have two choices at that point. You take the gamble, like Brad Binder did. Brad Binder thought, if it doesn't rain too badly, I can hang on. What they got? Six laps to go or something? I can't remember exactly. I think it was something like six laps. You know, and the fact is, is that when they started putting their hands in the air, looking around for a bit of support, as soon as the first one of that lot dived down pit lane, everybody else did. I remember thinking to myself, no! You're throwing the race away. And as it turned out, they did. Only for second place, though. They, they recovered for Banyai to make that second place. It's, you know, Brad Binder, his gamble was, I'm in a position here where I think I can ride this thing if it doesn't rain. But, of course, it carried on raining. They weren't to know how much more it was going to rain. Binder, in the end, if you've never ridden... Road bikes, they've got steel brakes on. They're with you all the time. Steel brakes, they work come rain, come shine, come whatever it is. Steel brakes, lovely things. Um, carbon brakes, as soon as they lose temperature, they don't work. You might as well put your hand on the tyre and try and stop it. There is no brake. You can pull, 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 pull. And there is no brake there because it's lost its operating temperature. And the same with a slick. A slick tyre, it's not about clearing water. It hadn't got a clear water. There wasn't enough on that. What it's about is moving the tyre around enough to heat the rubber. As soon as you lose the temperature in the tyre, it's like riding on a brick. You have got zero adhesion to the floor. And add a little greasy surface be between you and the, and the track as well, and it makes it even worse. So as soon as you lose heat in your brakes, heat in your tyres, I can't tell you how difficult it is to ride that motorbike. Anybody that's a, a bike racer that was watching that would, would have chewed down to their knuckles because it, it's the most frightening scenario you've ever seen. You shut the throttle. If you roll the throttle off too hard, the back comes around on you because there's no grip at all, even on the on the engine braking, because your maps aren't ma meant to operate in that zone, in that situation. So everything is wrong. So for Brad Binder to finish, I mean, some people might, might be at home and thinking, well, yeah, he rode it in the royal, you know, rode it round in the wet and he got it home and he won the race. Da -de da -de da. It seemed like that. Honestly, it is like being on ice with no brakes. You know, if you, if you, if you want to ride your push bike out on some ice, some, go, and, go and have a ride around on ice. And, and it, it's literally like that. It's mega unpredictable. There's no way. I mean, he hung on. He even got a penalty at the end because he slip slod through the, the last corner and got a, a three second penalty or whatever it was, two second penalty um, at the end of it. Um, luckily, he'd got enough still in hand for that penalty not to have affected. But I was in fear. I, I remember I was counting straight back. I was looking at the sheets and everything as I was coming through on my computer thinking, because oh, KTM, massive deal for them winning at their home Grand Prix. I mean, KTM had a clean sweep, didn't they? Moto 3, Moto 2 and Moto GP. I mean, obviously Moto 2 is a bit of a cheat because it's a triumph with a Calix frame, but but it's got a K KTM livery on it. <laughs> Fernandez Fernandez won it as a, as a, a Red Bull KTM. So so effectively KTM on the Austrian track uh, had a clean sweep right the way through. Uh, it wasn't a Red Bull liveried KTM that won the Moto 3, but it was still a, it was either a gas what was it a gas gas or a Aspana or a KTM. I can't remember. I'll have to look at my sheet. Hang on, put me glasses. <laughs> GT was Fernandez and Ayagura. It was a gas gas. It was Garcia, yeah, yeah. which is a KTM. Which is a gear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, Sorry. Well, it was uh, well, it was certainly a good day for, for Brad Binder, who, who was brave enough to make that call. Fortunately, his teammate got it all wrong, and it seems like it's 
got got a bit wrong for him since the summer break. We were all talking about Miguel Oliveira after his win, his breakthrough in, in the in the KTM. Crashed out in turn one. Uh, it just hasn't really gone his way since since the since his win, really. Well, he wanted to get home early to his wife that's now pregnant. Could be the reason. He's got a lot going on in his head at the moment, if you think about it. He's just got married. His wife is pregnant. Um, you know, things aren't quite turning out the way they are. I always believe these things are connected. I mean, you know, it's you have to have a, a, an incredible brain to be able to cope with all of the things that that young man is having to cope with at the moment. You know, he's, he's, he's back at a track that he does well at. Uh, it hasn't quite worked for him. He's, he's not in quite the place he was expecting to be on. Everyone else has made a bit of a step. Um, you know, and, and I, I said it in a kind of flippant manner, but I mean, marrying and having a pregnant wife are quite big deals. I can vouch for that as well in my life. It's a, it, it kind of does, you know, it has your, your focus is sort of split quite rightly too, but maybe not as far as the team's concerned. Well, it, it is a mental game, isn't it? As much as, as anything else, uh, Pete. Now let's come on to, um, sorry, let's come on to Yamaha. Actually, I want to, I want to just talk about Fabio Quartararo, um, who finished seventh in the end out of all of that, was being pretty brave on the brakes as well in his battles with, uh, with Mark Marquez as well, right at the front, and got actually into a few mistakes as well, going very deep into a few corners, turn three, turn four, losing a lot of time, doing the same thing again. <laughs> uh, and actually, I think we've got a couple of questions in um, from some of our listeners who were a bit annoyed that he didn't really get a huge penalty for those uh, those incidents and going off track and things like that. So, Quartararo, what did you make of his race? Because, you know, for a championship, for cur- currently leading the championship, it wasn't it didn't like he was, you know, riding particularly with that in mind. You've hit the nail on the head. <laughs> the nail on the head there, Harry. That's exactly what Fabio said. He said he wasn't thinking of the championship during that dry part of the race. He was just going for it, and he said he it was incredible to be fighting for the victory. You know, on the Yamaha at this Ducati KTM, if you like, track to be up there fighting for the win. He, he said it fantastic. He said that then when it started to rain, that was when he started to think, okay, we need some points here, and, that and that's when he started to make mistakes. <laughs> and that's when everything, yeah. And, and, and as soon as you start thinking about stuff, I mean, he was going flat out because that keeps your focus and your concentration. As soon as you start drifting and thinking about that championship. <laughs> and, and interesting, just going back on what Keith said about following other riders into the pits. Now, he was one of those guys in that league group. And, you know, Mark Marquez, I think probably the most interesting thing I thought from what he said, he, he had a lot to say about the tyres and everything else. But when he decided to pit, when he saw the rain, he then went, went into the lead because he knew, as Keith said, the others would follow him. And so by doing that, he pulled into the pits in the lead. The others all went in. So if he got it wrong, they would all have got it wrong. But Brad Binder was the guy who thought for himself and went, hang on a minute. And because of that, Brad went and won. But, but that's Mark with that, that extra dimension of just, you know, just with everything going on, he's thinking, shall I pit now, everything else? You know, it's safer to follow the other bikes in the group. Hang on a minute. If I, if I lead the group, the others will follow me. And even if we get it wrong, we're all getting it wrong together as the lead group. What and, you, uh, you know, is these blokes are hanging onto a motorbike that's trying to kill them at every corner. They're doing nearly 200 mile an hour in most places. And they're making these calculations simultaneously as well. There's no ship to shore radio. There's no crew chief in a Formula One type situation where they're able to, you know, even the dashboard messages are restricted to certain messages. You know, so you're, you're in a situation where the information that a rider has is pretty much in his head as much as anywhere else. <laughs> and for him to be thinking along those lines and for Binder to be thinking along those lines, I mean, I'm sure Binder if he'd thought that every other rider on the racetrack could gain 15 seconds a lap on him as soon as they got back out again, he might have been one that was diving down pit lane as well. But I think what he was gambling on was the, the rain not coming quite as wet as it did, quite as, as heavy as it turned out in the end. You know, as it turned out, it, it, I mean, at one point, it looked like Valentino Rossi, it would, would that have been his 200th podium or something? Yes. I seem to remember that would have been. But he, even he was thwarted. I mean, that would have been a great thing, wouldn't it? Um I tell me, I had that rattling around in my head when he was. I was gutted when Laquona started, started, started to fall down the uh, the order. I really thought, go on, go on, you well, just lost. I mean, a, you just lost your ride. But all of these guys are, are working. You know, they're, they're. I'm amazed. If it had been Moto Three or Moto Two, you'd have had carnage. There'd have been people crashing everywhere. But somehow, MotoGP, they have the mature. 
they have brains that are just a level above to be able to work to go as fast as they can on whatever they're on pretty much without crashing okay Zarko accepted they're, they're always going to be crashes in a race anyway but but the fact is is that the, the calculations that they're making when you've got someone that flies past you on a better set of tires and you're on slicks that are getting colder and brakes that are getting cooler the natural tendency is to just squeeze it a little bit harder just to get on the gas a fraction earlier and break a fraction later. And the only time you realize when you've got that completely wrong is when you're kissing the dirt. Um, so to be able to restrict yourself to what you know works in those conditions live at the time, in real time, is just... I can't tell you how much respect I have for these guys that we've got now in, in, in bike racing. I mean, they really are just a little bit special. It's incredibly impressive, isn't it? Um, now, your prediction, Keith, this weekend was actually for a Suzuki win uh, <laughs> in the form of Joanne Mir. Now, he did finish fourth in the end, um, but Suzuki, uh, Rins was all the way back in 14th at the end of all of that. Suzuki still seemingly developing this new rear ride height device they've got as well. They made, did they benefit from the fact that, you know, we've had two consecutive weekends in Austria, so it's the same track, get more data. But also, you know, fourth is not bad, but it's not it's not the win. As you I, think, I think everyone was expecting a great deal more. I think Mia and Rins particularly were expecting a great deal more. A week on from that, you know, that was a fantastic debut for the new shape shift type of pair, the whole shot device, whatever they're, you know, I don't know what the terminology Suzuki are using for it. But, um, you know, it was a fantastic bit of kit. They did their homework really well in the, in the five-week break, and they came out with the only thing that they didn't have compared with everyone else. And it worked first time out. And I genuinely believed, and I think everybody else did as well, and you know, like I say, it's not rocket science. I thought, as you say, with data and with their expectation was much higher for this weekend. But it just didn't seem to work for them. Rins didn't seem anywhere near like at the races regarding it. You know, Mia just didn't seem quite the, the guy he was last week. And that just comes back into what I said. A week on, you know, things change, tracks change, the field changes, and, and there you are. He wasn't the man of the day. Do you think it's also, Keith, because they don't have a satellite team, you know, and it seems like with these back-to-back -back races, Suzuki, from what we saw last year, they didn't really make a big step. We saw some KTM, I think, were perhaps one of the biggest steps last year anyway, from, from race to race on the two at the same track. Suzuki don't have the satellite team. Do you think it's the data thing that's maybe also a factor? Or? I, I think there's always there's always that factor in there because you know you're doing you've got to do twice the work to get to what a team can do when they've got four riders on bikes. You know it's it, it, it's it is what it is. And I, I think though that there was expectation and quite justifiably an expectation that Suzuki would do better this week, and that's that's why I chose Mia. But you always got to choose based on the weather. You know my my feeling was that if the, if it stayed dry, Mia would have been nearer to it. As it turns out. Because it was wet and horrible, Mir was further up the order than he would have been if it had been dry, as it turns out. I mean, I think that his ride wasn't particularly sparkling in the dry. It was only when everybody started shuffling the pack down in pit lane. And honestly, I'll bet you, you bloody Formula One guys, I bet you're all falling about laughing when you watch our pit stops. I bet you just fall over laughing. I mean, bloody Red Bull can change four wheels in 1.8 seconds and get out of the way and not fall over themselves. Our blokes look like bloody, honestly, hop, skip, jump, falling over each other, kicking the bike, kicking one of the mechanics got kicked in the face. I mean, it's just, you think to yourself, do these blokes never ever practice this? Yeah, it just looks terrible. Well, yeah, I know. I know you would do because you're a car man. And at the end of the day, that's about the only thing you can be spectacular at. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Harry. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, who was? I think Jack, Jack Miller had a particularly, uh, I think, a bit of a clunky uh, stop. Well, it's, well, it's just clumsy. I mean, it's just. I, I mean, like, and it can only come down to practice. You know, you know, Red Bull. They are pushing that car in and out of that zone hours a day, working their guys to death on it because it makes such a difference. You know. Why would you spend millions of pounds on a motorbike that you're trying to get half a second a lap out of or a tenth or whatever it is, and then you give away a second and a half in a lousy pit stop? You know, it, it kind of doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> and and, and I, never, I never understand why on a Wednesday when we arrive at the track, or a Thursday, if you like, at the latest, during press day and stuff like that, why there are not teams pushing bikes in and, and practicing that hop, skip, and a jump into the into the zone i don't get it and i mean uh, Jax was, was in fact they all looked like they were going to fall over i mean it, it just looked daft in places and i well i mean Miller, Miller really came really in before Mir, and then Mir got out before him and finished fourth where did Miller finish all the way down in 11th so 
I mean, I know there's more, more at play there, but that could have, you know, a quicker pit stop would have had a dramatically different outcome. Well, I think yeah, it comes under the heading of must do better. And uh, But the problem is, is that, that this has been going on now for years since we've had flag to flag and, and, and kind of it's been going on for years. And we say it every time, well, why, don't, why does that look so scruffy? Why, why doesn't that actually work for the teams? Because no one's taken it seriously enough. You know, <laughs> I, I always think it's a bit like... Stop here and go there and... Yeah, you know, and on all this stuff, and I think it must sit on the workshop wall. And oh, it might rain. We better unhook that now and bring it, bring it to the front of the garage. <laughs> and it's literally, um, it's one of those slightly amusing situations in MotoGP that just shouldn't happen. You know, it should be the slickest thing you've ever seen. A rider should come in, hit his marks, put one foot down because you've got to put a foot on the floor now. You can't do what Marquez used to do, leap from one. <laughs> you've got to bring the clutch in and put it in gear, whereas in the old days when they first started this, a mechanic, mechanic already had it in gear with the clutch closed, so all you've got to do is jump on it, gas it up and dump the clutch. That's not allowed now. You've got to do that as a rider because you can you imagine, you know, like kind of get it wrong and dump the clutch and it goes to the back of the garage at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> so there are quite a lot of things that could go wrong in one of these pit stops. But you would just think that by now MotoGP might have got, or, or not MotoGP, it's not the rules, it's the way that they've been uh, interpreted, delivered by the teams in pit lane. And of course, just one extra one on from that, of course, it is different in every pit lane. It's difficult for, for, for right, the angles of the bikes and stuff like that. If you've got Phillip Island that's about as wide as you know, my computer uh, and you've got someone like Red Bull Ring or Indy that's really, really wide. You've got plenty of room to mess around in. It's, a, it's, it's different at every single track. So you must practice it at every single track. It's not like a car where it pulls up parallel and you've got the room to do what you do. Uh, it, it's much narrower. So your angle of attack and your angle of exit are, are, are slightly different as well. I don't know. It just looks wrong. And I think must do better, boys. <laughs> we do see them practice at the end of warm-up. And I think... Uh, I think yeah. what it, it reminds me of the England football team and penalty shootouts. You know, you can practice all day, but when you get that pressure, because when you see them practice in warm up, they, 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 they go like clockwork, and then suddenly in the race, it's it chaos. Doesn't. It doesn't, Pete. They come in and it's kind of, oh, do I have to bloody do this? You know. Kind of... <laughs> well, that's why it goes like clockwork because it's so relaxed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, very oh, bloody hell! Do we have to practice? This? <laughs> <laughs> from headmaster keep there must do better um finally though uh, let's just talk about honda top honda in the end was alex marquez in ninth but of course it was mark marquez who was running right at the top for, for so long and d- outdone really by uh by the change uh in weather but again honda just well bar marquez seemingly nowhere i mean nakagami no, she didn't really show the pace that we thought we might see from him right at the start of the austria the double headers um but marquez doing a good job and, and working around his pain his pain issues that he's been having here as well massive pain oh, the, the, you watch him on the bike and you think is that mark marquez you just watch him whether when he dangles his leg into a corner it's like a half half cocked leg everything he just does not look right on that motorbike he's riding it I mean, he'll be back next year. I mean, he will work through all of this. They will do what they need to do during the, the off-season. He will be back next year. There's no doubt about it. His determination hasn't gone. He's still prepared to throw it at the fence if he needs to to go fast. Um, so he, he's, he's not changed in that respect. Mark Marquez will be back. This is not going to be his year. This will be you know, a year working his way through the pain, through, those, through the situation he's in. Honda will come up with a whole raft of stuff next year when we get in 2022 and the and the uh, technical freezes have, have, have gone by. I mean, uh, you said it right, I think maybe before we came on here, Harry, you know, this, this MotoGP just keeps on giving. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is in MotoGP at the moment. We just have such a great sport here. And it's going to continue next year as well. I mean, you know, I've been back in MotoGP for, what, eight years now, and, and it never stops. It's just relentlessly great. It's relentlessly good. There are, there are no one, forgive me for this, and I don't mean this as a, a side, even though I take the mickey a bit out of you four-wheel guys, you know, MotoGP is envied by all motorsports. You know, M- MotoGP is in such a good position. There are other great motorsports out there, obviously, four and two wheel, but, but MotoGP at the moment is giving everything. It's, it's just whatever it might be, drama, rule changes, riders, personalities. You know, we seem to, seem to have it all. And I feel next year is going to be even more so when we've got... These, the, the rule changes, the, the, the freeze that we've had on, on engine development and the like, when we get to next year, it's going to be spectacular, I feel, providing the pandemic's done and we're all 
able to go testing and get back down to, to work. Penalties, I thought, were very inconsistent again this weekend. You mentioned Mark Marquez. Well, and I mentioned he was determined and he was going to come back next year. But, I mean, the first one where he batted a lace out of the way, that was definitely Mark Marquez's fault. He went in too hot at turn one. But again, you've got to remember that, particularly at the Red Bull Ring, that turn one is an absolute sod. The first time you get to turn one throughout the whole week is when you're in a race. You've not practiced that. You're not allowed to do a start from the start line to the first turn. So when you arrive there, you arrive there at a guesstimate. You're guessing where your braking marker is. You're guessing pretty much where everyone else is. When someone else hits the, you know, the old rule of thumb from my days was when someone else hits the brake, that's when you think about it. <laughs> and you ram it up the in- and that's certainly a Mark Marquez rule of thumb because he'll stick it up the inside batted Alicia out the way Alicia was mad as hell then we had the restart um, last time and uh, this was this obviously wasn't this week it was last week and uh, in the restart bloody hell it's, it's Mark Marquez that's belted into Alicia again now Alicia tried to lean on him and someone else was underneath Mark at the time so Mark ended up in a bottleneck but there weren't really any penalties, and we've seen some penalties delivered. I think Cameron Bobier got a penalty in, in Moto2, which I just thought, that doesn't seem right to me. It didn't seem like a penalty that was justified. It seemed like a racing incident. You know, Moto3, you know, a long lap penalty and a, and a pit lane start for a man who's just broke someone else's arm. It doesn't seem right to me. Um, Jürgen van der Gerberg, you'll all be across the Jürgen van der Gerberg um, comments regarding what's happening with Slipstream and all the rest of it, and a lot of it he has put down to, to gearing in that you're geared to a situation where you must have a slipstream to be able to pull the top two gears on a motor three bike. He's advocating that you narrow the, the gear ratios down so there isn't that much of a gain in a slipstream situation if you're geared correctly. Um, I won't go into it on here because I'll send everybody to sleep, but I, I kind of I know what he's talking about. And anybody that wants to look it up, look up Jürgen van der Gerberg because van der Gerberg knows what he's talking about. And he's absolutely right. If you've got a, a very tall top gear that you wouldn't naturally be able to pull unless you're stuck him behind someone and you swap that for a gear that's only perhaps 500 revs different from the one that previous in your gearbox, then you, that slipstream suddenly doesn't become so critical. And while we're on the subject... I've not read this anywhere. This is one from, from, from Hewan here, which will go down like a, a lead brick, I'm fairly sure. But I think from a penalty point of view, I think that instead of penalising people from pit lane and long lap loops and all the rest of it, I think you need to penalise them through their ECU. Every time that they have a transgression, not 500 revs off them. Take 500 revs away from them next time out. You know, you can do that. I'm, I'm fairly sure electronically you can do it during the weekend. You know, this is a dial it in type situation. I'm sure that there is a situation there where you can you can put an electronic penalty on these guys. So their bikes <laughs> suddenly you've lost revs, you know, throughout the entire race. Hello, goodbye race, you're done. Doesn't matter if you start from pit lane or anything else like that, you're not going to be able to use the performance. There has got to be some other way. And I feel through technology it can be done rather than a, I feel like we're 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 living in a digital era, but we're we're looking at analog bloody um you know cures for the problem i think that we need to look at it in a more digital kind of a manner a more now kind of a manner and i'm i'm convinced that electronically i, I love Jür- jürgen van der goldberg's thing i think that that needs testing that definitely you can it's a very cheap fix you can say you've got to use this ratio if you're using that ratio in fourth gear then the only ratios you're allowed to use above that are x and x x and y if you like and um i think that will uh pretty much cure it but if we test if they do a test like that running bikes like that it'll be very interesting to see the difference how much difference that makes but like romano fanati somewhat eloquently and uh, wonderfully poetically said that a slipstream is like oxygen to a moto three rider and we need to take the oxygen away <laughs> sometimes particularly from romano fanati who was exceptional again this weekend riding around the outside of people i thought he was brilliant Anyway, that's he, another, he another rant from, from Hewan. No, a Hewan exclusive. I like it. We should have one every week. I think we'll clip that up <laughs> and get it out. Um, right, I, we've got some discussions in, but I want to touch on Motor 2 and Motor 3 before we come back to them. But at the end of all that, that the second race in Austria, uh, we could look back on that. And uh, I think it was, was one of the ones that perhaps changed things quite dramatically in the championship because uh, Courtois is still in the lead, has a 47-point advantage over Bagnaia now. Uh, in second with 134 points, and Joanne Mir is called to be up to third ahead of Zarco. 
So uh, Zarco, the big loser from this weekend so far. Uh, let's talk Moto2. It was Sam Lowe's on pole. There was uh, smiles all around for that. Uh, but in the end, he couldn't hang on to it uh, and kind of expected that really with his tyre choice, perhaps, but uh, still managed to, to come home uh, with a top five position. It was Ralph Fernandez who got his uh, fourth win of the season ahead of Ayagura, his first ever podium. Augusto Fernandez rounded out the podium. Uh, Keith, what did you make of the Moto2 action? Because, you know, Remy Gardner didn't really feature with pace that, that much this weekend, it looked like as well, down in seventh in the end. I always think of the Red Bull ring like Snetterton, which might right. sound Maybe. weird to a lot of people, but it's a very, very simple racetrack. Ten corners, nothing much to it, like the old Snetterton used to be before bloody Johnny Palmer got hold of it and put a few more squiggly bits in it, um, but, and then, then named it after himself. Um, but the, the Snetterton was a very simple racetrack that was very difficult to get right. And I think that you have the same problem at the Red Bull ring to a great extent. And I think Remy... Remy did the right thing in the circumstances. I mean, he didn't have a brilliant weekend last weekend. He found himself sort of, you know, out of sorts, and he couldn't make it quite work this time. Same problem for Sam. Sam's never really got on that well with the Red Bull Ring. It's not one of his favourite racetracks. So I think a fourth place equaling his, I think that's his, equals his best of the year anyway, fourth place. So um, I, think, I think he must be pretty happy with that. And pole position, that one lap pace, but he wasn't happy with the softer tyre. He wanted to run the harder tyre, the feel in it. And half the time with, with, a, with a race bike, it's, it's about feel. You run what you, you think you're going to go best at. It might not be the best tyre, perhaps performance-wise, but it, it's what makes you run at your best pace. And he chose that. It was a good finish at the end of the day on a racetrack. That you, he wasn't expecting that much out of it when he came into it. So I think he will have gone home a, a happy man. Um, Rail Fernandez brilliant of course but uh, i mean the standout moment for me was with simon crafar in part for me afterwards when he basically wanted to have a go back at all the trolls i just love that when a rider turned around and said you know this one's for you you know like all the haters uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> fantastic i mean that is the way to to treat you know armchair trolls that are having a go at somebody that's putting their life and their effort on the line and trying to move their way through i can't wait till he goes to another gp um it, it's interesting that he, he he's still not really not really the happiest of men, considering he's going about a GP. But anyway, that's I, I still think he's going to be good when he gets there, once he, he, he bites the bullet and gets on with it. But um, it's an odd thing, isn't it? I, I can't really work that out, how you know, KTM are almost forcing him into that position when he clearly doesn't really want to go there. I've never, I've never known anything like that. I mean, everybody wants to go to MotoGP. You know, even if, even if in your heart you're not sure whether you're going to be able to achieve what you're going to be able to achieve, and again, speaking from experience, I remember the first factory I rode for was Suzuki. And I remember I'd, 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 I'd done quite a lot of good works on a, on a 350, and, and, and that, which was Moto2 of my day, if you like, and, and, and been there in, on you know podium for, for, for that class and so on. But then Suzuki, I had a meeting with Morris Knight. Uh, Peter Agger Morris Knight ran the factory team out of Beddington Lane in Crawley. Or is it Croydon? I can't remember. Anyway, um, and I remember sitting down in this, at this desk with these two very high up men, very, very influential men in our sport. You know, Heron Suzuki was a big deal. Barry Sheen had been through there. Steve Parrish had been through there. You know, Randy Mamola, you know, Crosby had been through there. Have we lost? Have we lost Harry? <laughs> oh, you're back. So all these guys have been through Bennington Lane. And then I sat there on the other side of this desk and this bloke, I said to him, what, what are you expecting from me? And he said, well, you're to win. This is Grand Prix, 500s. And I remember thinking then, crikey, I, didn't, I wasn't sure I wanted to go. So I've got some sympathy in a long-winded kind of a way we get there in the end with this conversation. I've got some sympathy for, for Rail Fernandez in that maybe it's a, it's a massive step to go into MotoGP. And it could cost him if he, if he doesn't actually make it work straight away. He's, he's got to really perform straight away. And I, I've got some sympathy for the bloke in that situation. But... I've got the feeling also that he's going to be all right. He's going to be pretty good because he's a class act, Fernandez. But stick one up the trolls. I like that. <laughs> Always hate the haters. Uh, it was a fourth win for Ralph Fernandez. Uh, Pete Ayagura, first ever podium in second. Looking good, actually. And, and, and you know, I think quite rightly now really on the radar, perhaps, you know, for, for, for a MotoGP future, perhaps not next season, but, you know, certainly hotly tipped uh, to be a future Grand Prix rider at the highest level.